as we were planning for a day such as this, various mechanical pieces around the site, we, um, we have to begin the sermon right at 10 past 10, which means I need to be done. <laughs> no excuse. <laughs> at 11. Um, so the other guys are going to turn on and get the sermon in a few minutes. And so I could do a Gavin Clark and get everyone, he does a great job too, of getting everyone to say hello and all that. We'll have plenty of time afterwards to do that because what's a, what, a, what another mark and another means of grace is fellowship with one another. And so we've set up morning tea outside on this beautiful day, over there and over there. And so feel free to gather and fellowship and do so um, in, in the blessing that it is to be a child of God. So to pass just a couple of minutes, I'd love for you to turn with me to Psalm, 9, uh, Psalm 44. Psalm 44, beginning in verse 13. You, that's speaking of God, you make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scoffing and a derision to those around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a laughingstock among the peoples. All day long my dishonor is before me and my humiliation has overwhelmed me. Because of the voice of him who reproaches and reviles, because of the presence of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us. But we have not forgotten you. And we've not dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back and our steps have not deviated from your way. Yet you have crushed us in a place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had not forgotten the name of our God or extended our hands to a strange God, would not God find this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Last verse, 26. Rise up and be our help. And redeem us for the sake of your loving kindness. Well, I trust that you can all hear me. And we now turn to the word of God. We come now to... The very words of God. And there's something very special. Something very unique. About pausing. From. All the words of the world. And sitting under the. Words of the one true. And living God. In a world filled with. Deception and error. We really are blessed. To be able. To always turn to truth. And we're truly blessed to have received the ability to understand divine truth. Because remember that it's we and we alone who possess the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. That is the Holy Spirit wrought ability to understand divine revelation. The natural, unconverted person cannot understand the Word of God. And so this grace gift is ours, and it's only ours as the church of God, by union with Christ, who is the head. The head. The Holy Spirit's ministry of 
illuminating truth to us through the word of God is a tremendous grace gift that we possess. And so this morning will be the third, maybe the final, not sure yet, in a little series, you know, we've been working through called The Word in Season. And I want us to continue considering portions from this epistle that we've been looking at to the saints of the Colossian church. And I trust that the duplex gratia, the duplex gratia, which if you recall from parts one and two of this little series, are the two graces, that double grace, that are ours as believers. Christ for what? Pardon. And Christ for? Power. Trust that that's a comfort, a consolation to you, a safeguard even. A safeguard, you remember, so as to not move away from hope. Move away from the hope that we have in the gospel. That hope in the gospel is biblical truth so wonderfully revealed to us in this letter from Paul to the church at Colossae, which we saw last Lord's Day was written at a time when, you remember their pastor, Epaphras, the pastor of the church, he went to Rome He went to Rome to tell the Apostle Paul about the dangerous ideologies, the dangerous teachings that were going to soon make headway into the church. And hence he writes, you remember in Colossians 2 verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, ideology and deception. You know, pastoral ministry And the primary, though not sole, responsibility of the pastor is the preaching of the Word of God. The preaching of the Word of God serves, we know from Ephesians 4, to equip the saints, to drive out falsehood, false thinking, false doctrine. And therefore it acts as a chief instrument for Christ in the providing for and the protecting of the church. Christ promises to do just that in Ephesians 5.29. And Christ accomplishes that, the providing and the protecting of the church. He accomplishes that through His Word. He mediates that through His Word, read privately and in a very unique way, proclaimed publicly on the Lord's day. As the Holy Spirit attends the preaching on that set-apart day for such a thing. The Word preached accomplishes a number of things In our life, God has ordained the preaching of the Word of God on the Lord's Day. It accomplishes things like informing our consciences, equipping us, and ever conforming us and renewing our minds and our very lives into the will and the ways of God. And we do that in season. And we do that out of season, regardless of the times, whether they're times of ease or whether they're times of suffering. Look at me, look with me at verse 23 of Colossians 1. Again. Paul says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Verse 24. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. We'll consider that remarkable statement and what it means and doesn't mean in a moment. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints to whom God willed. To make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is 
is what we've been considering the last two Sundays, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Verse 28. We proclaim Him, Jesus, warning every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. Christ is the Lord of the church. And He summons as Lord to Himself ministers who serve as custodians of His flock. It is the role and responsibility of pastors to preach the Word of God with sermons full of Christ, proclaiming Him, admonishing and warning every person, teaching every person, person with all wisdom so as to present every person complete in Christ and we do so as Paul wrote on behalf of his body on behalf of the church making known the riches of Christ Christ in you that is union with Christ which is the hope of glory when Christ is proclaimed not simply here is Jesus he moves you from being guilty to not guilty and provides you with an assurance policy for hell. But when the riches of Christ's glory, his person and who he is and what he has done are presented before the church by a pastor who has great struggles on their behalf, who fills up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Now, what that doesn't mean is that there is anything to add to Christ's suffering. Christ's affliction, Christ's suffering is done. It accomplished everything. But what it does mean is that the minister might receive with gladness any persecution or any affliction that would come from preaching the Word of God. On behalf of Christ, as a minister for Christ, proclaiming the Word of Christ to Christ's people. And so when a pastor who has great struggles on their behalf fills up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, proclaims the glories of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, proclaims the riches of what it means to be in Christ, when that is preached publicly and then privately studied, where further glory is to be beheld, and personal application to then make, then, once all that has occurred, look at verse 2 of chapter 2. Then, hearts are encouraged. Hearts are knit together in love. The indescribable wealth from our assurance of our salvation occurs. Which causes us to not only know that we are saved, but to rest and rejoice in the one who has saved us by his kind provision, will ever, ongoingly, by his kind provision, never forsake us and never leave us destitute. That's what occurs. And when all that takes place, when all the saints that are encouraged, because they are presented with the glories of Christ. They are reminded about and they plumb the depths of our union with Christ and what that means. Look at the end of verse 2. It says it results in a true knowledge of God's mystery. Christ himself. When the body assembles, when the body assembles, and faithful ministers proclaim Jesus and unfold Jesus and lay before the assembly the glories of Christ to behold, true knowledge of a mystery occurs. Think about that. Knowledge of a mystery. That's a seeming paradox if you think about it. How can you have knowledge of a mystery? Here's what Paul is saying. God is a mystery. God is altogether unknown. 
1 John 4 verse 12 says, No one has seen God. God is hidden from the world. But we, and only we, the saints of His body, the church, only we have seen God. There's a lot of people in this world, and only we, the saints, see God. God is unknown, unseeable. We know Him, and we see Him. We alone know Him. We alone see Him. We know Him because we are in Christ. And Christ is in us. John chapter 1 verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time. But the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Now, the word explained there is the word exegeted. He, the Son exegetes the Father to us. That's how we know the Father, because the Son reveals the Father to us. Just as the minister exegetes the Son to the body, the church, through expository preaching. The minister exposes the people to the truth and reality of who the Son is. The Son reveals to us all the truth of who the Father is. And that only happens to the saints. Paul says, for this purpose, I labor and strive. For this purpose. That's the purpose. He says, I endure suffering and preach the word of God on behalf of the church, filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. For this purpose, I labor and strive that saints might be encouraged. That saints' hearts might be knitted together. That saints might rejoice in the assurance of their salvation. And that saints might rest in the confidence of knowing that the one who holds them securely right now will also day after day after day care for them all the way through life. Paul says, we live that not in our own strength. And not from our own wisdom, but according to Christ's power that works mightily within us. Because, and for, look at verse 3 now of chapter 2. Because in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That is to say that Christ is sufficient. Christ is enough. More on that later, but first look at the next verse, verse 4. I say this to you so that no one will delude you with persuasive or plausible argument. I say this to you so that no one will persuade you with even a plausible argument. Interesting. Warning every person against the attacks upon the gospel. Warning every person not to embrace false ideologies that comes in many forms. Plausible arguments made by plausible people. For the Colossians, it was... According to verse 18, look there of chapter 2. It was the ideologies of worshipping angels, of visions, of self-abasement of the body, which is the Greek word conveying the idea of false humility. They come with such false piety, inflated egos. That was the context in Colossae.
though in a different context, that's still certainly plausible today, false humility from critical race theorists, inflated views of themselves and their ideology, evidenced by virtue signaling and censoring opposite narratives. Why do the people at Colossae do this and why do the people who embrace a ideology today, why do they, why do, they do this? Even when they have an appearance and they come as angels of light. Look at verse 19. Because they don't hold fast to the head. They don't hold fast to the head. The Lord Jesus. The head is Christ. Look at the rest of verse 19. From whom the entire body, that's you and I, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. If you don't hold fast to the head and hold fast to the body, you don't grow. We either grow from growth that comes from God by His Spirit through His Word, privately studied, publicly proclaimed, or we grow into an ideology that is altogether anti-gospel. You'll recall that Paul rebuked the Galatian believers by saying in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Our present day has too many believers bewitched by the tricks and trinkets of our pervading ideology, neo-Marxist wokeness. That's an ideological worldview that seeks to make a distinction with the purpose of division between controversial issues, things like moldy and non moldy Dare I say it? The vaccinated and the unvaccinated. But God's word tells us ever so clearly something radically different. Look at verse 11 of chapter 3. Verse 11 speaks of a renewal. That's to be born again, to be regenerated, to receive saving grace. And enter into the faith, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew. Circumcised and uncircumcised. Barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. But Christ is all and in all. This is how the Christian mind must think. This is what it looks like to have the mind of Christ. While the world's ideologies segregate and divide, in Christ we are all one. All one. In Christ, we see that we are moved and motivated to look out for the interests of others, not just our own. In Christ, we marvel, don't we, that He put our interests above His own comfort when He was here on earth. And He suffered for us. John Piper brilliantly puts that together. That Christ put our interests above His own earthly comfort and He suffered and died for us. May we never be found making comfort and ease our goal. May we be willing to suffer for the one who suffered for us, the one who made us one. He made us one by the blood of His cross. This world and its ideology, it just wants to further divide people on all sorts of things. Sadly, like I said, race and even vaccination status. Now with ethnicities, yes, each ethnicity has a very rich culture to honor and to respect. But being in Christ supersedes all culture and all personal decisions regarding your health. The blood of Christ is thicker than any water, if you will. And the blood of Christ unites us together. And when we hold fast to the head, hold fast to the head, that is Jesus, 
We are each, as a collective body, moved to growth. We must hold fast to the head. Because from the head we are supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, which is from God. We must reject even the most plausible arguments. And instead, we must plumb the depths of our union with Christ. And how that union with Christ includes, in a very real way, our union with one another. When you read other literature, it'll drive you to an individualistic existence. But when you read the pages of Scripture, it speaks about community and corporate. And so we grow in wisdom corporately. We grow in the grace of God corporately. Where we dare not divide what God has united. Our God is not a God of partiality. He calls us in James chapter 2 to not show partiality to anyone of any ethnicity. Of the rich and the poor. Of the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. We must not fall for the deception and the divide from ideologies. In our case in the West, this neo-Marxist ideology. Look again at chapter, at chapter 2 verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men. According to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. And so instead, what must the saints do? The saints must dwell upon and draw from the duplex gratia. Christ for pardon and Christ for power. Because both of those are from our union with Christ. For as I said last Sunday, our union with Christ has a federal aspect. A covenant aspect. And a faith aspect. Federal union refers to how we as believers were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1. Just as God the Father chose us in Him, God the Son, from before the foundation of the world. So our union with Christ has a federal, a covenant aspect. And then our union with Christ has a faith aspect. Faith union. This refers to how when we put our faith in Christ... And anyone who puts their faith in Christ evidences that they have received the new birth. Because you'll always remember, and I know you'll never forget, that we are born again and then we believe. We do not believe and then are then born again. Regeneration precedes faith. And so when we put our faith in Christ, evidencing that we've received the new birth, we are then actually placed into all the fullness of our union with Christ. And so our union with Christ commenced in eternity past. It was made ours in full actuality at conversion and is ours for all of eternity. And we considered the aspects of what it means to have union with Christ last Lord's Day. In that since we are united to Christ, then we are united to Him and share with Him all the points of activity on our behalf, as Sinclair Ferguson so wonderfully stated. We share in His death. We were baptized into His death, meaning that the sting of death and the old nature no longer has victory over us. It's gone. We share in His resurrection, His perfect life and Resurrection power are ours, meaning that we then have a righteousness that comes from his perfect life. We then have a strength that comes from his resurrection power. And both of those are outside of ourselves. Both the righteousness and the power, Christ for power, come outside of ourselves and they come to us 
because we so desperately need them. We share in his ascension in that since he was raised to the heavens, we have access to all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. All the riches of heavens are ours. And if you missed all that from last Sunday, you can pick that up online. Our union with Christ is an astonishing truth. In his book entitled, A Man in Christ, James Stewart wrote this, quote, Union with Christ, rather than justification, or election, or even eschatology, or indeed any of the other great apostolic themes, is the real clue to an understanding of Paul's thought and Paul's experience. It's been well and often said, That once you see union with Christ, you'll see it almost everywhere in the pages of the New Testament. Swiss reformer and faithful pastor, John Calvin, called union with Christ that doctrinal truth of, quote, the highest degree of importance. What I want us to consider this morning is what our spiritual union with Christ looks like here on earth. That is, what is the practical application of our union with Christ? And so with that in mind, let's look once again at Colossians chapter 3, as we have been over the last few Sundays, and see how our union with Christ brings about two vital things that we need to be continually present and even ever increasing in our life amidst this rapidly changing world. Number one, we need to be dwelling upon the truths of union with Christ because it causes our hearts to be filled with the person. Of Christ. Not just the benefits we receive from Him, like the forgiveness of sins and the like, but the person of Christ. And number two, the overflow of plumbing the depths of our union with Christ causes our lives here on earth to be lived. With the very marks of heaven. Look again at verse 1. Therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 1 is describing our resurrection with Christ. When we were united to Christ by faith and laid hold of Christ, we laid aside our old self, our old loves. Our affections were radically altered. The Apostle Paul said that we move from loving the things we once hated to hating the things we once loved. We've moved to another frame of reference when we've been raised up with Christ. To be raised up means we died. We've been raised up. All of life has moved to another frame of reference. We've left this world behind. We are with Christ in the heavens in every spiritual sense. Our life, our belief, our worldview is radically different from the world. The world has one understanding. We've left that. And now live with our life hidden with Christ in God. It's truly no exaggeration to say, as some do, that our new life in Christ takes us to another dimension. We live here on earth in full possession of heaven, heaven's realities. We live with eternal life. 
We live with peace with God. We live in possession of the mind of Christ. Spiritual eyes to see the glory of God in the person of Christ and so on and so forth. And because of that, because that's true, God, via the Apostle Paul, urges us in verses 1 and 2 to keep setting our minds on the things above where Christ is. Verse 2, set your minds on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Now, those words there of exhortation in verse 1 and 2, to keep seeking and to keep setting, are conveying the idea, not just of giving intellectual assent to Christ and the spiritual blessings that are ours from Him, from our union with Christ, but those words... They convey the idea very strongly in the original language to be delighting in Jesus and enjoying the benefits and blessings that come from him. Most translations render verses one and two with seek the things above and set your mind on the things above. And that's true. But what we cannot do is make those two terms of seeking and setting synonymous. Because the idea in verse one is a Greek word that talks of desire, talks of affections. So much so that the NIV translation took the liberty to render the verse, set your hearts on things above, even though the word for heart is not there in the original Greek. And so when you take this repeated command in verses 1 and 2, it's a command for the entire person, mind, affections, to be full of Christ and his saving benefits. Verse 3 gives us the reasons why we ought to do so. Look at verse 3. For you have died. I mean, I think I need to ask myself a question at this point, And I think maybe you need to ask yourself a question at this point and say, have have you died? Now, the danger of a question like that is, for the believer, you have died. You've gone. The old nature is gone. You can't say to a dead person, keep dying. They're gone. So when I ask myself that question, have I died? I don't say, um, I say, yes, I have died. And my life that I now live by faith, having been raised up with Christ, my life I now live is hidden with Christ in God. That is just an, an astonishing Verse, our life is hidden with Christ in God. If we have died, then there is no turning back. Meaning that you recall from last Sunday, because our life is hidden with Christ in God and we have died, then we are safe and secure safe and secure now, awaiting our glorification. It means that and it also means the idea that the world cannot understand our life. It cannot understand why we think what we think, what we do what we do, what, what we hold fast to, the hope that we have, the abiding joy that we possess, the peace that we exhibit. The transforming glory that we behold, they, they have no clue. I want you to see what Paul is doing here. Here, in his first three verses. He is providing for us motivation from the gospel. Not from legal demands of just go on and do more better. No, no, he's providing motivation from the very depths of the gospel. On why we should delight in Christ and fill our hearts with Christ and not the values and the ideologies of the earth. 
Remember, in verse 2, when it says, not on the things on the earth, that's not talking about your job or, 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 or taking care of things that need to be taken care of. He's talking about the values and the ideologies of the earth. Do not be bewitched by them. Three motivations here that Paul's giving us. Let me show you all three. The first motivation for ensuring that our life is marked by Christ being our all in all, if you will, by our fuel for continually keeping our minds on the things above where Christ is. The first one is found in verses 1 and 2. It's because I am united to a risen and resurrected Savior who is in the heavens. That's the first motivation, meaning that if he is there, my heart and my mind and my life ought to be there too. And if my heart and my life and my mind is down here, something's amiss. That's the first motivation. And then in verse 3, we're given the second motivation for ensuring that our life is marked by Christ being our all in all. And that is that we've died. Our power source for life is altogether different and new. Think of it like that. And so if Christ is my power, I've got him for my pardon, and now I have him for my power, why do I go to other sources for life and power? And attempt to stabilize and sustain myself As a crucial member of the body, the church, why do I attempt to stabilize and sustain myself by setting my heart upon earthly values and ideologies and thinking? I've died. My life is hidden with Christ in God. The third motivation for ensuring that our life is marked by Christ being our all in all and that we continually set our minds on the things above where Christ is is because of where my future will be. Look at verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. When Christ, who is our life, by dwelling upon our union with Christ and not the tactics and the trinkets of this world, we're moved to dwell upon Christ Himself, And then we meditate upon his word when we worry in the night, when we walk about in the day. We're moved to say to ourselves, I am a child of God. I'm united to not only a beautiful savior in Christ, but I'm united to his body here on earth. And as a people, we've been blessed with the supernatural ability to see the beauty of the one who said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And because of Christ, I have peace with God because of Christ and his love for me. I have the forgiveness of all my past, present and future sins because of Christ. I'm indwelt with the spirit of God because of Christ. I have full assurance of faith because of Christ, who is our life. And so number one, we dwell upon our union with Christ because it ensures that we focus on Christ himself. And number two, the overflow of plumbing the depths of our union with Christ causes our lives here on earth to be lived with the very marks of heaven. I want to look at that now. But think of it all like this before we do. Since I am dead to the world, why would I dwell upon the world? Why would I dwell upon the values and the ideologies of the world so as to seek comfort and consolation and stability from the world when I have been raised up with the one who has overcome the world? Who has made me to share in his death, burial and resurrection. And even from verse 4 tells us that we share in his return. So that my life here on earth on my way to heaven, which is not marked by pristine perfection, but by tangible progression of growth in godliness as my heart and my mind is filled more and more 
with the heavenly Christ. And when my heart and mind is filled more and more with the heavenly Christ, the more my earthly life is dramatically affected. How do we do that, though? That's what I want to talk about now. How is the overflow of my union with Christ, how does it affect my life here on earth? How do we do that? Well, a few things. First, we must pray. We must pray. We must pray privately. We must pray with our families. We must pray corporately as a church. We must pray. Look at verse 9 of chapter 1 with me. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. And what's the content of the prayer? The content of the prayer is this. To ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. To please Him in all respects. Bearing fruit in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all power. According to His glorious might. For the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Look at this. Joyously giving thanks to the Father. Who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Prayer. We must ask God to help us. And our prayers must be informed about what we just read there. Think of it like this. Father, please help me to know you through your word. Please create in me a clean heart that hungers more for your word. Forgive me for not turning to the pages of scripture to hear you speak. So that I may receive wisdom. Because I really need that. And understanding. Thank you for giving me that. By the work of the spirit. And his ministry of illumination. I want to please you Lord in all areas. Lord help me to bear fruit of good works to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Help me to be increasing in my knowledge of you. Strengthen me with your power and your might. So that I might attain attain true and certain steadfastness among this crazy world. That I would be more patient. And never forgetting to give you thanks, Father, for you've adopted me to be one of your children and to inherit what all the saints with the church, eternal life, have inherited and eternal fellowship with the light of the world, the Lord Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. We need to pray privately as families, as a church, asking God to work in us. Second, we need to remain thankful. Thankful. Look at verse 6 of chapter 2. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. Look at verse 17 of chapter 3. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. We need to be thankful. We need to pray. Third, we need to remain fixed on the sufficiency of Christ in the gospel. Look at verse 20 of chapter 2. If you have died with Christ, since you have, is the force there, since you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Ideologies press in upon you and say, do not.
In Colossae, there was great risk that if people were not filling their minds and hearts with Christ and remaining prayerful and thankful, because the prayers and the gratitude is fueled by union with Christ, dwelling upon Christ. It's not the other way around. There was great risk if people weren't filling their minds with Christ and praying and being thankful, then they would be duped into, deceived into a way of thinking that was anti-Christian and anti-gospel and be bound up wrongly in their own conscience and then found to be trying to bind the consciences of others in the assembly. We need to be very, very mindful of that exact kind of thing as the world presses in on us at the moment. And decrees, do not, do not, do not. Instead, we need to keep looking to Christ, empowered by the grace that God gives us to relish our hidden life in Christ. And live in light of the truths of Colossians 3, 1 to 4. That we've been united to a risen Savior King who's in the heavens. And because we've died and our power source for life is altogether different and new. And because our future is, a, is certain in eternal glory. Therefore, verse 5, here it is. Therefore, consider your bodies as dead to immorality. Impurity. Passion. Evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Verse 8. Therefore now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you've laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And now here it is. Here it is. Verse 12. So, as those who have been elect of God, chosen of God, holy and beloved, here it is, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Union with Christ even impacts our marriages. Look at verse 18. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Union with Christ impacts our parenting. Look at verse 20. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they will not lose heart. Union with Christ even affects our employment. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with mere external service as those merely pleasing men, but with sincerity of the heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Chapter 4 speaks about employers treating their employees with fairness, Look at verse 5. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, as those, see them, as those season with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. All of that that we just considered, all of that occurs when we are praying with an overflow of gratitude, when we are rejecting the world's mandated decrees that are and treating them as though they are the gospel. And all of that occurs, look back at verse 16 of chapter 3. It 
If the goal is to be continually seeking the things above, God always provides his people with the means to accomplishing that goal. God never commands and then leaves his people without how to accomplish that. And look at verse 16. This is how we do it. We let the word of Christ richly dwell within us. And then the result is wisdom. The result is teaching. The result is warning. The result is singing to one another psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. The result is that whatever we do, we'll then do all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this time. We thank you for this letter. Lord, it's our letter. We thank you for the truth contained within. We thank you for this urging, gracious urging by your hand for us, your people, to be ever setting our minds, our affections on Christ above and not upon the values and ideologies of this world. Father, Help us not to be moved away from hope. Help us not to be moved into embracing, even in the subtlest way, imbibing any of these ideologies, but to lay them off. Our world has an ideology right now pressing in on us. We want to live as lights and salt in this earth, in this world. So we thank you for this time. Bless our fellowship now. Lord, may it be sweet. In Christ's name, amen.